During the Civil War, the Air Force was born. And as early as 1898, the War Department showed interest in the glider. But it took a pair of clever bicycle makers who tinkered with a man-carrying kite to add imagination and power. Wilbur and Orville Wright gave the glider a water-cooled engine of their own design and two chain-driven eight-and-a-half-foot pusher propellers. The toss of a coin in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, won Orville Wright the chance to be the first man in history to fly under power. Airtime, 12 seconds. Distance, less than the length of a B-36 weight. Wilbur Wright went to Europe in 1908 to find a market for the flying machine, which up to then they were unable to sell. His flights on the continent attracted the president of France, as well as the kings of England, Spain, and Italy. To Wilbur, it was endless work. In addition to acting as pilot, he was ground crew, mechanic, and salesman. A team of horses pulled the plane to a wooden monorail. This was to serve as a runway on the grassy field. Lifted by a few men, the flying machine was swung into position facing the wind. To provide thrust for the takeoff, the Wrights had developed a weight-falling catapult. After the props were spun, the engine kicked over. Wilbur and his passenger, a French journalist, took seats on the lower wing and braced themselves for an exciting ride. He convinced Europe, winning applause, but no sale. Back in America, encouraged by President Teddy Roosevelt, the War Department opened bids for a heavier-than-air flying machine. Signal Corps specifications required that it carry two persons a distance of 125 miles at an average speed of 40 miles an hour. The Wright signed a stiff contract. Finally, at Fort Myer, Virginia, they flew a machine that was accepted as U.S. Army Airplane Number 1. By 1913, 41 Army pilots were decorated with these gold military aviator wings. Among them was Lieutenant Henry Arnold, who later, as commanding general of the AAF, led two and a half million airmen to victory. Another aviation pioneer, Glenn Curtis, also built early Army trainers. Soon, more inventors improved the machine with tractor instead of pusher propellers and the Army began to see the new airplane emerge as a weapon. By 1916, our only trained aviators were a few Americans flying with France, and they made us proud. They were the famous Lafayette Escadrille, started by Norman Prince, William Thor, Victor Chapman, and Bert Hall, who courageously fought when Germany had full control of the sky over Europe. When German U-boats forced us to declare war, American air power ranked 14th. Believe me, we were far from ready. I was a rookie cadet, I ought to know. They gave us wooden guns and told us we were going to turn the tide. You know, in a couple of weeks, we began to look as though we might do it. For training equipment, we molded our own bombs out of plastic. Pretty soon, we trained with the real things. Lewis machine gun. Having met the requirements, we were issued leather flying cogs and helmets. Assignments were made. We got a chance to fly. First, we made a pre-flight check of the Beeling wire plane. Then we tied our wings. Fifty hours in the air, a few bombs. We were checked out, ready for advanced training overseas. America was producing airmen, but we didn't have a single fighting airplane. Only a few of our leaders were wise. Newton Baker, Secretary of War, was one. He insisted, Supremacy of the air in modern warfare is essential. Woodrow Wilson was another. 
The president asked for $600 million to meet the needs of military aviation. Meanwhile, Red Cross girls saw us off on our way overseas. Since Congress couldn't vote us time, we went to France without airplanes. But we did go in style. Camouflaged luxury liners like the Leviathan were used as troop ships. Some of us half-trained flyers went to Britain and Italy, but most of us went to France. There, we found cities of wooden barracks and muddy streets. In outdoor classes, we practiced gunnery. Wooden models helped us learn how to lead a plane with our fire. Battle-tested aviators took time out from the war to show us how to handle the stick. Finally, we soloed. The first ride was always a thrill and a bumpy experience. However, it was much easier to talk about turning the tide and to produce fighting aces overnight, even if some of us were lucky. Late in 1917, France met the AEF's first Aero Squadron, commanded by Major Ralph Royce. His outfit was the first to see action, and they proudly pasted paper iron crosses over enemy bullet holes. Our commander was Colonel Billy Mitchell. America's first flyers were there, General Benjamin Falloy in command of supply and schools. Colonel Thomas Milling, head of air service units, 1st Army. And Colonel Frank Lahm for the 2nd Army, commanded by General Bullard. When Major William Thor and the Lafayette Escadrille became the 103rd Aero Squadron, they brought a record of triumph. Thor, five German planes down. Lieutenant Larner, three. Lieutenant Merrick, one. Lieutenant Tobin, three. Don't forget the aces. Captain Field Kindley with 12 victories and Major Raoul Luffberry with 17 before they were both grounded forever. Then those who lived to take part in another war, Captain Elliot Springs with a score of 12 and the ace of aces out of the ring Captain Eddie Rickenbacker with 26 victories. America's airplane factories and us war workers didn't get started until late. To make airplane wings, they took us house carpenters, furniture upholsterers, even seamstresses with high pompadours. Meet Rosie the Riveter, 1917. Painters use varnish that smell like banana. The fuselage, which we finally chose, was the British design. The engine was all American. Manufacture was the outstanding production achievement of the war. In all, 4,500 DH-4 airplanes powered by the Liberty engine were put together in this country. They were built by Ford, Lincoln, Cadillac, and Packard, automobile manufacturers. Curtis, Martin, and Wright, still famous plane-making names, were busy assembly plants in those days. World War I gave America its great aircraft industry. Each plane was test flown. Then, the thousands of parts were painstakingly dismantled for packing under guard. Crated and addressed, it was off to the front. In France, husky mademoiselles handled the wings like toys. Here, parts were reassembled into the fighting craft, which helped sweep the enemy out of the sky. May 1918, and the first American DH-4s rolled directly from assembly sheds to the airfields. Only eight months after they were ordered into production, they joined American aviators ready for the big push. When the order to prepare for battle was given, truckloads of aerial bombs were delivered to the planes. There, armorers fused the bombs and loaded the racks. Then the boys who had to take them up made sure the job was done right. The boys still talk about the big push. When we lifted the flaps that September morning in 1918, everything was ready. Billy Mitchell had asked for every Allied airplane that could fight. We brought them out. 
The brass ordered a tremendous air force to control the skies over the Samahil sector. This was the first army's field of battle. For the dawn takeoffs, we put flares on our wingtips. Every Allied field on the continent gave its plane. General Mitchell called for 1,500. We actually got 1,481 off the ground. Wooden props bit into the air and the engines began to rev up. Our mission was to protect the doughboys of the First Army. Some had orders to bomb and strafe enemy installations, others to engage the Germans in the air. This was it. Each pilot had been carefully briefed for his part in the mission. U.S. aviators in 609 American planes, now a solid part of Allied air power, rose to attack. Germany put albatrosses, Fokkers, more than 30 different types of planes in action to fly no man's land patrols. Some of the Huns dropped bombs by hand on our troops. With over 120 different types of aircraft, the Allies fought back. Our boys were always quick to single out the enemy and come in close to attack. The German was hurt. He tried to escape but couldn't make it. Our pilot signaled that he had made another kill. And after a victory roll, he rejoined his buddies. Other enemy ships strafed our observation balloons, burning them out of the sky. Allied air power struck back in force. The sky was a beehive of battle. We overwhelmed their air defense, winning and holding air superiority. It was almost the same a few weeks later in the Meuse-Argonne offensive, where we bombed with telling effect in the most notable aerial effort of the war. November 11, 1918, closed a chapter in the unending story of the United States Air Force. Visual history has shown us some of the courageous men in uniform and out who cradled the dream of flight and gave us aviation. In the history-making job that lay ahead is the inspiring chronicle of more Americans who continued the pioneer spirit. Men with an idea who planned and worked and fought to build the greatest striking force and protective power in history the United States Air Force. He was born in the golden age into a family of wealth and influence, but chose the Army as a career and way of life. Brilliant, inventive, and outspoken, he enlisted as a private to fight in the Spanish-American War, arrived in Cuba as a lieutenant in the Signal Corps, and emerged as the youngest captain to serve in the Army at that time. He taught himself the basics of aeronautics from a book and became the leading exponent of air power to a reluctant general staff. Promoted to Brigadier General in less than 20 years, his meteoric career collapsed after he charged the military and civilian command of the nation's defense with negligence and ineptitude. He predicted the First World War with Germany, the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, and even an age when planes would fly at a thousand miles per hour. His foresight and outspokenness won him both a general court-martial and a special medal of honor. His name is Billy Mitchell. He was tempestuous, he was controversial, he was outspoken, he occasionally acted intemperately, but it was Billy Mitchell who gave to us the vision of modern global aerospace power that we have today. That is why Billy Mitchell is a legend of air power. William Mitchell was the grandson of a Scottish immigrant banker, Andrew Mitchell, and the son of a United States Senator, the reform-minded Democrat John Mitchell of Wisconsin. 
Billy Mitchell was a college junior of 18 when the Spanish-American War was declared in 1898. He heard the news, decided to enlist, and took the train back to the family home in Milwaukee to join the Wisconsin Volunteers. After completing his basic training with the Wisconsin Militia, he was shipped out to a staging area in Florida where he was called to active service with the U.S. Army and offered a commission as a second lieutenant in the Signal Corps. By the time he arrived in Cuba, most of the fighting was over, but he impressed his superiors with his industry. He taught himself the entire code system of the Army, taught himself Spanish, and even typing to improve the appearance of his reports. By 1901, he was promoted to first lieutenant and sent back to the States for a series of assignments taking him to Alaska, Virginia, Colorado, and finally back to Virginia in 1904. He was now the youngest captain in the Army, eager to learn all he could of the new emerging technologies, radio, submarines, and airplanes. He met Orville Wright in 1908, when Wright was preparing for Army tests at Fort Myer, Virginia, where Mitchell happened to be stationed. While Mitchell did not actually witness the flights, he was impressed with the potential of what he saw. Over the next 10 years, in a variety of posts, including the Army's colleges at Fort Leavenworth in Washington, he read everything he could find on aviation. In 1914, Mitchell wrote a paper for the command college, envisioning the possibility of invasion and attack by hostile patrol vessels and aircraft. In 1915, Mitchell took flying lessons, four of them before soloing. Now 36 years old and a newly promoted major, Mitchell was made head of the Army's aviation section in Washington. He began studying other nations' air forces, making particular notes on Germany, France, and Japan for their advanced aircraft development. By 1917, Mitchell believed the United States could no longer avoid becoming involved in the war in Europe. Both sides were hopelessly stalemated in trenches on the ground. American volunteers were flying with the French army in a unit called the Lafayette Escadrille, but tactics were almost non-existent, and the death rate was appalling. Mitchell finagled an appointment as an observer with the French army. One week after his arrival, German U-boats sank the liner Lusitania, and the United States, completely unprepared, entered World War I. Despite promises of thousands of American-built planes, the United States had almost no pilots to fly them. Flight school consisted of 50 hours of rudimentary training, often with disastrous results. So the peacetime nation began the process of building airplanes out of cloth and wood. Designing easy to assemble aircraft which were tested then disassembled and packed in crates for the long voyage across the Atlantic. In the next six months, Mitchell was promoted to full colonel, 
and given command of U.S. Air Forces assigned with the 1st Army. Mitchell believed that air power demanded special persons to be pilots, and he actively recruited those he felt demonstrated the right qualities. One of them was a young chauffeur attached to General Pershing's staff. He'd already established himself as a race driver in the States before the war, and so Eddie Rickenbacker of the famed Hat in the Ring Squadron became a flyer, an ace fighter pilot instead of a driver. But there were still no American planes to be had. Mitchell struck a deal with the French. If they would give him the planes, he would fly American pilots against the Germans. On Sunday, April 14, 1918, Mitchell gave the order to launch patrols against reported incoming German aircraft. Two American pilots took off and in less than two minutes engaged the Germans. Two minutes later, both German planes had been struck and their pilots bailed out. By July 1918, after four exhausting years of warfare, both sides were reaching levels of desperation. While the French and British controlled their sections on the ground, the Germans controlled the air. Attempts to send up observation planes only brought a swarm of a dozen German fighters eager to send them flaming to the ground. The Americans devised a counter strategy. Observation airplanes were escorted by as many as 50 American pilots. Now in the summer of the fourth year, the Germans made an all or nothing assault on the French American lines near San Miguel. 70 German divisions crashed against the Allies and buckled the front lines. Mitchell recognized the Germans would throw thousands of airplanes into the fight unless he beat them to it. He ordered 1,500 planes to be readied and actually launched 1,481. He attacked the German supply lines, cutting the troops off from behind and trapping them between Allied ground forces and his massed pursuit planes and bombers. In the four days of the offensive, American flyers made 3,300 flights over enemy lines, dropped 75 tons of explosives, and destroyed 60 German aircraft. Based on his success in smashing the German offensives and coordinating air and ground units, Mitchell was promoted to Brigadier General in October 1918. He was drawing up plans for a new combat contingent. Armed with machine guns, these special infantry units would parachute into position from bombers designed to carry a dozen or more men. The war ended before Mitchell could try his idea. It would be another year before it was tested by one of his junior officers, a young major named Hap Arnold. With the victory of Allied forces came a prayer from the public that such a war, with such terrible losses of human life and weapons of destruction, never be allowed to happen again. Many called for the elimination of the army, the destruction of the Navy. Aces like Rickenbacker were shown by the newsreels, trading in their uniforms for new suits to pursue peaceful careers. Some of the flyers took up barnstorming, demonstrating the skills they had learned in combat to thrill crowds who gathered anywhere the sound of an airplane engine could be heard. Mitchell returned to Washington and the War Department as the acknowledged expert on military aviation. But those who commanded the Army and Navy felt that aviation was still just an adjunct to artillery and battleships. The service heads joined with powerful groups in Congress to effectively wipe out the aviation units in favor of more conventional weapons. Without realizing it, they began a battle which would last longer than the war itself and cost Mitchell his career. It was Billy Mitchell who first recognized in this country that the stakes of warfare had changed 
that three-dimensional forces, those operating in the atmosphere and those operating below the surface of the sea, would hold two-dimensional surface forces hostage. And he paid with his Korea for his outspokenness in championing that view. In the spring of 1919, Mitchell wrote an article in which he predicted, the Atlantic is going to be crossed, and within short times, we shall have regular airplane mail transportation between America and Europe. We no longer measure distance by miles, but by time. The commercial traveler, henceforth, will read the new air timetable and find that Chicago is four hours from New York, or Los Angeles is 28 hours from Boston. To prove his points, he launched the first transcontinental air reliability contest of Army aircraft from New York to San Francisco. But as deputy director of the Air Service, Mitchell focused his energies on convincing the Congress of the value of his vision, that air power would soon overrun that of the Navy's warships and Army's ground troops. His vision was made public in congressional budget hearings, where he testified and laid out his challenge. All we want to do is have you gentlemen watch us attack a battleship. Give us the warships to attack and come watch. A furious Navy secretary, Josephus Daniels, replied that he would stand bareheaded on the deck of any battleship Mitchell tried to bomb. The test began June 20th, 1921, off Hampton Roads, Virginia. One by one, over the next month, Mitchell's planes targeted and hit mothballed American and German ships. And, one by one, they sank. The final attack was against the German battlecruiser Ostfriedland on July 21st. Largest of the German dreadnoughts, she had already survived a combined torpedo attack and salvos from British battleships in World War I. The American and German navies considered her unsinkable. Mitchell's flight of bombers sighted and dropped their payload. They placed the bombs around the ship, crippling the battleship's hull. It took less than four minutes and four bombs. Ostfriesland rolled and went down. Mitchell next led a flight of Martin bombers against the retired U.S. battleship Alabama. With General Pershing and other Army and Navy officers looking on from the transport ship San Miguel, the air group sent the ship to the bottom. But the success of the bombing test did not spell the end of Mitchell's troubles with the Navy and War Departments. In fact, it made things worse. Despite promises from the new president, Coolidge, to create a unified military department and support for expanding the Air Corps, nothing happened. The Army and Navy kept their individual departments. In 1925, Mitchell was reverted to his permanent rank of colonel and transferred from Washington to Kelly Field as air officer. Others who had supported him, like Hap Arnold, were also reduced a grade in rank. 
Following a pair of air disasters in September 1925, Mitchell issued a press release which said, the accidents are the result of incompetence, the criminal negligence, and the almost treasonable administration of our national defense by the Navy and War Departments. On October 3, 1925, Mitchell was ordered to be court-martialed. The trial lasted weeks, and Mitchell continued to be blunt with the court and prosecutor. Prosecutor, you say that in future wars, soldiers will invade by leaping in parachutes from airplanes? Would you care to reveal who gave you this startling information? Mitchell, nobody gave it to me. It's quite obvious to anyone with the slightest foresight. Is it your actual belief that the country is vulnerable to attack from the air? In the foreseeable future? Colonel Mitchell, do you have any idea of the width of the Atlantic Ocean? Approximately 3,000 miles. And the Pacific Ocean? I know what you're getting at, and I tell you that it won't be long before airplanes will fly non-stop across both oceans. You say that airships traveling 1,000 miles an hour will fight each other in the stratosphere? Do you have any comprehension how fast 1,000 miles an hour is? Of course I do. Do you know it is faster than the speed of sound? Approximately 250 miles faster than the speed of sound. You say that the Hawaiian Islands, our base at Pearl Harbor, will fall victim to an air attack? Does your crystal ball reveal by what enemy this mythical attack will be made? By whom, Colonel? By whom? The attack will be made by the Japanese. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, launching their planes from aircraft carriers just as Mitchell had predicted. The court found Mitchell guilty of insubordination and suspended him from rank, pay, command, and duty for five years. Billy Mitchell resigned from the Army and retired to his farm in Virginia. Now a civilian, he continued his campaign for a separate Air Force Department and unified command under a Department of Defense. He met with old friends and supporters and spoke and wrote constantly to the public. But in 1936, the wear of the years and campaigning finally took Billy Mitchell. He died February 19th in a hospital in New York. Billy Mitchell fought with distinction in two wars. He set a world speed record and proved beyond question that his vision of the future for the nation and his beloved air service were correct. Though a thorn in the side of those he considered mossbacks for failing to be innovative or intelligent, his voice and vision reflected his love of country. What Mitchell did was he lit a fire that burned within the hearts of air power advocates after him. People like Hap Arnold, Tui Spots, and their successors. And his example, uh, I think, should be with us to the present day. He is a revered figure and should be as long as the Air Force continues to exist. On July 18, 1947, two months before his dream for the United States Air Force was finally made a reality, a special act was passed by Congress promoting Billy Mitchell to the rank of Major General, retroactive to the date of his death. It was finally recognition of the contributions to his country by this legend of air power. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. 
Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunderchief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescapes YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.